Hey guys, welcome to my channel. Okay, so this video, I'm, I'm just, I was listening to his second confession again, and I, now after knowing what we know now, sometimes when you l look back and listen to some of the old evidence and the old video, watch the old videos and listen to the old interviews, you pick up on things because now we know more than, you know, the first time I listened to this or the first few times I listened to it. So I went back and listened to that second confession again and just I found a couple things I wanted to point out. First of all, I want to point out a few things that he says that I think just confirms him being a narcissist. It just kind of confirms some of the traits and some of the things we know about how a narcissist is and how they feel and how they don't feel, I should say. So the first one I want to point out is they ask if he loved NK. They said it would be, Graham goes, oh, let me ask you, did you, did you really love her? And he, his answer is kind of strange. He says, well, I felt like it was true. Who answers that? I don't know. That just seems kind of odd. Who would say that when somebody's asking you if you love somebody and you answer, oh, well, I felt it. I felt like it was true. I mean, why that, that just seems like a kind of a weird answer to me, I mean, if you think about it, narcissists, you know, they kind of mimic. They don't know the, how to feel. I mean, they don't know what they're supposed to feel. And they just don't have those natural feelings and, and natural emotions that a normal person would have. So they actually have to go by what they see and what they observe and try to figure out you know, what it means to love and what it means to be this or what it means to be that. So for him to say, well, I felt like it was true, it kind of, I feel like, sounds like it's something where he thought that was the way love is supposed to feel. And instead of, you know, saying, oh, I, yes, I loved her, like he just, it's almost like he felt like it was true. He felt like, oh yeah, I guess this is true. This is probably what love is. Instead of just knowing that you know, those feelings that you have that, yes, oh, yes, I, I love them. I feel it. Like you feel, you know, when you love somebody, you just feel it. Like you wouldn't have to be like, well, I thought it was true or it felt like it was true or, you know, like, what do you mean true? Like, I mean, if it's you, you should know if your feelings are true. I could see if you were talking about like her feelings, like if they asked, did she love you? And you could say, well, I thought it felt like it was true. I thought it was true. Like I thought, I think her feelings are true because you don't know what she's feeling so I could see that for answer for asking about her but they're asking about if you loved her so wouldn't you know if they were true or not why would you have to well I thought they were true wouldn't you just know if they were yes you should know that th that they are unless if you're a narcissist and then you don't know yeah you only know by comparing maybe what you think it means to be in love and you know what what you read and what you see and what you think rather than what you feel when you know so for you to to answer like that i mean i just it just feels like that that would be just how a narcissist would answer because how would they know for sure because they don't feel it they wouldn't just know because they know because they feel it they have to compare it to just what they know about love and so they're not sure well i you know like just how you looked up how do you feel when someone tells you they love you the first time and stuff like that it just you should know that you don't need to look that up or read about it it's just something that you feel love is just love isn't something that you learn how to do like as far as oh let me read what it feels like to be in love you just feel it it's a feeling you know it's not something that you learn so okay so i'm going to play you that clip here it is can i ask kind of a cut question mm -hmm. um did you love it i felt like it was true yeah i felt like it was Okay, so another, the next one I want to play you is when they're talking about Ronnie's addiction. So, yeah, Tammy asks him, you know, he, she's asking about his childhood. And because she, she, they're trying to figure out, you know, why he did this. And if there's any hints, like, in his childhood, if anything happened, any trauma or anything. And then they bring up Ronnie's addiction, his drug addiction. And then Chris goes on to say, you know, well, he acts like he doesn't even know what cocaine is. He's, oh, this white powdery or whatever, but it was cocaine, they say. And he says that it, deep down, it really didn't hurt as much as he thought it would. Like, 
It's almost like he was saying, you know, yeah, he thought it, you know, it should have hurt me. Should have, you know, probably from seeing other people go through family members with addiction or, you know, seeing movies and just seeing that it's supposed to hurt. You know, it's that should be painful watching somebody you love go through an addiction. So he's seeing that, knowing that it should hurt, but because he's a narcissist, it doesn't really hurt. So he was expecting it to hurt, and then when it happened, it didn't hurt. So he was like, yeah, deep down, it really didn't hurt as much as I thought it would. Because he doesn't care. He doesn't have that ability to really care, to, to actually feel that compassion or that empathy or to feel any hurt for somebody you love going through a painful experience. You know, his dad is supposed to be his hero, and he's saying his dad's coke coke addiction his drug addiction didn't really hurt him deep down like he thought it would i feel like that's pretty telling i mean think about it you know one of the narcissist traits is not being able to feel those emotions and not really care not feel that compassion for hit the one person that he calls his hero is addicted to cocaine and knowing that you should be hurting when somebody you love is suffering with an addiction but him saying well wow it didn't even hurt me really deep like I thought it would. So that's just another thing that kind of caught my attention when I was re-listening to it. So here I'm going to play that part right here. I know you talked about your dad having an addiction when I was talking to you. That what was after I left. Uh, I left home. Is that, was it cocaine or something? Or? It, was, it was some type of powder. I'm not sure. I okay. Guess it was cocaine. I guess How that's... do you think that affected you? I don't think it affected me. At, uh, well, it did affect me, but it didn't, didn't like take like deep down it didn't like really hurt as much as I thought it would. It was kind of weird because of my thing that my mom and my sister told me. Like when they talked to him about it, it didn't seem to register. Like I said, like he would just change subject. And like when I talked about it, he eventually, um, immediately changed subject. I was like, because they found like, you know, cuts on his like CDs and stuff where he would like, you know, like oh. separate it and stuff like that. Because yeah. he, he had a car dealership. I mean, find guys that do that kind of stuff all the time, I guess. But he was just coping with, like, I never came back home. And because before I met Shanann, and it was just... Did you feel guilty that he's now using drugs because you never came back home like he lost his kid? You no, know, I just, I never really knew why he was doing it. I, after the fact, I knew it was because he was coping with that. Oh. But. I never knew why he really actually turned to drugs, but my mom thought he was having an affair because like, all this money was going somewhere else just for the drugs. But like I'm not myself, I never use drugs, so I always try to tell him like, hey, like what's going on? Like why did why do you need to use this? And just like you could use this for a whole lot better better things, you know? Just don't throw your life away. I mean, like because you can see in his face, like you know, it's like eyes were like everything was getting like you know gloves through your face and like and your skin was getting all loose and like he was losing a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. His nose was bleeding all the time and all kinds of stuff like that. And I was just telling him like, hey, you know, you smoke like every day of your life since you're like 15 or 16. And you're like, you know, I can't get you to stop that, but I get you to stop this. Right. And he, he put it away, I guess, pretty quick after I talked to him about it. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to point out is the part where he talks about how he read a book that says no dad should hurt their children. Why would you even have to read a book to know that? I mean, that should just be something you know because you feel and you know you're, you're their dad and you love them and you would never hurt your children. Why would you need to read a book to know that fathers shouldn't hurt their children? So that's just another thing that kind of confirms him being a narcissist. In my opinion, I mean... Let me know what you guys think, but here, I'm going to play that part for you. I was, I'm just hoping that, you know, like, like no, no father would want, ever want to do anything to hurt his, his blood and flesh, but I did that, and I just don't understand how it happened. So, I mean, I even read books that say, you know, like, no, no guy would ever do anything to hurt his children. Like, this happened. So I always think of myself, like, did I, was I even a dad at one point? I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to read a part of this article that I think it fits it fits what we're talking about here in these examples I gave you in those in that um confession. Okay, so it's about narcissists, obviously. Okay, so deep inside the narcissist knows that something is amiss. He does not empathize with other people's feelings. Actually, he holds them in contempt and ridicule. 
He cannot understand how people are so sentimental, so irrational. He identifies being rational with being cool-headed and cold-blooded. That part just reminds me, remember that interview, Ronnie, that I just did the subtitles for where he is all proud of being cold-blooded? And even Chris in the interviews, you hear him talk a few times about, you know, how he just, he doesn't let things get too escalated. He, you know, he he's very cool. He's very calm. He knows how to, you know calm things down or whatever words he uses but basically you know he's kind of proud of that trait about him are you telling me the truth i'm telling you the absolute truth why should i believe you because i'm a very trustworthy person and the people that do know me they know how i'm a calm person i am not an argumentative person i am a person who is that's never going to be abusive or physical in any kind of relationship I would never harm my kids. I would never harm my wife. I mean, you can talk. I mean, any, you can talk to any of my friends, any of her friends. They know me. They know I'm a low key guy. That's quiet. So I'm. I'm not about confrontation. I'm not about anything that elevates to that level. I mean, you can like if someone like yells at me, screams at me, I just take it and I just. Try to get it by the wayside and get it back to where it's a cool, just a cool conversation to where like none of that, none of that gets to that height. Because I am not that person. I've never been that person. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to continue here. He substitutes remembering for sensing. He relegates his bodily sensations, feelings, and emotions to kind of a memory vault. The short and medium term memory is exclusively used to store his reactions to his narcissistic supply sources, actual and potential. Many narcissists have emotional resonance tables. They use words as others use algebraic signs. With meticulousness, with caution, with the precision of the artisan, they sculpt in words the fine-tuned echoes of pain and love and fear. It is the mathematics of emotional grammar, the geometry of the syntax of passions. Devoid of all emotions, narcissists closely monitor people's reactions and adjust their verbal choices accordingly until their vocabulary resembles that of their listeners. This is as close as narcissists get to empathy. Many narcissists can intelligently discuss those emotions never experienced by them, like empathy or love, because they make it a point to read a lot and to communicate with people who claim to be experiencing them. Thus, they gradually construct working hypotheses as to what people feel. As far as the narcissist is concerned, it is pointless to try to really understand emotions. But at least these models he does form allow him to better predict people's behaviors and adjust to them. Okay, so I thought that part of the article actually highlighted what I was just talking about in those examples from Chris's second confession. I think it highlights it pretty well and, and explains it and kind of, you know, gives you a better, explains it better than I could. <laughs> Okay, so the next part I want to play for you, it sounds like Chris is saying they woke back up. And a few people have pointed it out in the comments, so I went back and listened to it, and it does sound like that. I think one of the channels that pointed it out was, why do you care? So thank you guys for, the, there, there's a few people that pointed that out. It's like, we look into this, and it does sound like that. It sounds like he says they woke back up. And it's almost like he's thinking, he must forget, and he's thinking that Graham and, Tammy and Dave that they like know already because they're asking about the kids like oh well okay so uh, you know he's asking the details and he's saying oh yeah they woke back up it's almost like he's talking to him like they already know what happened I mean I know they didn't but it's like he forgets and he's just like oh yeah they woke back up like an, like an accident is what I'm kind of implying like he accidentally like he's talking to them forgetting that they don't know the details and you know, saying, oh, yeah, they woke back up. In reality, they have no idea the extent or what the heck that even means. Now, after the fact, we know, like, so I'm not sure, We you know. I'm almost positive that's what he says. Let me know if that's what you guys hear. Sounds like he says they woke back up. And it makes sense because they're talking about the kids and 
Graham is asking about the details of, you know, how it went down. And it would make sense that that's what he would be saying in that, in that context. So I'm going to play that for you. Here it is. Did you take her back to her room? Downstairs, back my truck up. At that point, were the girls still there? Okay. So then she lands in the truck, then went back to the house. Got her back in the truck. Was Bella first or was Cece first? And the truck. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. So she was first, and then Bella was next. Was Bella alive when you put it when you guys got on the truck? Oh, okay. What happened? I hold it back up. 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 Okay, so the next clip I'm going to play is the part where he lies again, but he even uh, points this out in the book actually about him lying and telling them that he was thinking about killing himself and he goes on to say you know I didn't even deserve to live and he, you know why he brought that gas can he just thought you know he should just he doesn't even deserve to live he should just kill himself but then you know the new book comes out and he even says that he didn't even feel any remorse after he did that when it was all finished the only thing he was worried about is if he remembered to put the dog in the cage like he said that's what he thought about like how ugh, how evil is that like how emotionless is that should i say but anyway i just wanted to point it out because he says you know when he says it in the interview how he says yeah i didn't even deserve to live and i felt so horrible like about what I did and I felt like I didn't deserve to live and well we know afterwards by what he says that he didn't really feel that way so he was basically just feeding Graham and Tammy a line of bull you know like he didn't mean that obviously so I mean I know we all know he's a liar but I like to just point out like all his lies and just if, I don't know just to confirm and hopefully maybe if we could figure out all his lies somehow we could figure out what's true and what's not at least what's not true but anyway so i'm gonna play the part in the interview where he's talking about oh he felt like he didn't deserve to live and blah 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 which is a bunch of crap because obviously he didn't feel that way and this is another thing that he supposedly told Cato that kissinger was his soulmate and he felt no remorse after killing his family all i could feel was now i was free to be with nikki he wrote after the slaughter feelings of my love for her was overcoming me i felt no remorse so I'm going to play that part where he basically lies and tells them what he thinks he should have been feeling and what he thinks they want to hear and he should say, which goes along with him possibly being a narcissist too, you know? Okay, so here it is. So I think I saw um, on the video that you put a gas can or something in the back of your truck. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Did you have different plans was... when you put that in there? I don't know what was going through my head. I felt like I, maybe I could just get rid of myself at the same time if I was doing all this, honestly. Yeah. Did you just think about that? What did you think about that? I felt like I deserved to live after what had happened. Was there any thought to the whole family going away that day, to include you? After everything happened, not the definite thought. Yeah. See, it's interesting to me. Um, we had all kind of wondered if there was a point when we were all together, and if we were all going to pass together. That, to me, makes sense, because that's, even though it sounds crazy, um, that's what a family man does, right? Family man doesn't do what he did. No, I know. I guess what I mean is, um, it seems like you guys were going to be together forever in that way. Is that maybe what went through your head? I, honestly, I just felt like I didn't, I didn't deserve to live. Yeah. 
and it was like whatever judgment I was going to come upon myself, you know, was, I just didn't deserve to be on this earth anymore. Mm -hmm. What happened? So what made you not do that, do you think? I don't know if it was just more of like a, because with the, with the site, maybe it was just more of like, I would have hurt more people than just me and everybody else. Like, I know there's other people out there, not like at the site, but other people like maybe out in the area, like, I didn't want something like on the site to catch fire and blow up. And then other people around would get hurt in the same. So you were thinking initially about starting a fire out there or an explosion or something or just no, not not for not for that, just like maybe I could just take care of myself and not have that you know, I mean you want gasoline, that's the only thing you do. I mean, I don't have like I don't have a gun, I don't have anything like that. It's not like you can just commit suicide that way. But so just, just like, blow yourself up. I mean it was just I wasn't thinking. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I, it was, I mean, I don't have, I don't have weapons. I don't have, I've never hunted before in my life. I don't know what, I mean, nothing was right that morning. Yeah. I remember you kept telling me that. You kept saying, I didn't know what I was doing, Tammy. I didn't know. Like, yeah, when you asked I remember. She, like, what were you doing? Like, I don't know what I was doing. Yeah. I think you were just like in automatic mode or, it seemed like. So did you str drive straight out there? So what were you thinking on the way out there? Uh, it's it's kind of like what I'm doing right now. I'm just like, you know, nervous, shaking, not knowing like, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah. Like I know like my life has completely changed. I don't know like what's happening. Like honestly, like I try to picture that, that whole ride, like it's like 45 minutes to an hour ride out there. Yeah. And it's just like, couldn't I have like saved my girl's life? Couldn't I have done something? Why did I do it? I don't know. All right. Okay. So the next part I want to play for you is a part where he talks about how he had basically no control over it right before he was about to do that sh to Shanann. He felt like he had no control and, you know, he was going to do it no matter what or whatever. And then they ask him, Graham asks him, well, did you, so that you never thought about that before? And he just kind of avoids the question and just goes on talking about something else. He never answers, like, basically what we know now that he was planning it for a couple weeks. You know, he never really answers or tells them that he was planning it. So, once again, lies. But we, I mean, we know that because he even admitted to Cato afterwards how he didn't tell the FBI everything and how he held back things. But, I don't know. As I was listening to it, I was just, there's, you know, things that stood out. Like, even with NK, I, you know, I did a video where, you know, when I re-listened to it, anything where she was lying in or whatever, even though we know they're both liars, but just to kind of, like, point them out and do little clips so you guys could hear them all together or whatever. I know this is stuff you guys already know, but, you know, things that knowing now what we know and then to be able to hear the little clips again all where he lied or where, you know, knowing what we know now where he said something different. So sometimes it's it's good to rehear it, you know, in, in a different context because if you guys haven't re-listened to the second interview after his third interview, I guess you could say the book, that letters from, um, from Christopher could be like his third confession, right? So if you haven't listened to the second confession after you heard the third, then when you listen to the second, it's like you listen to it in a whole different context. But now you have this whole different story, I'm going to call it, of, you know, how he says it went down and all the new details. So when you listen to it again, it's like, there's certain things that's kind of different hearing it in a different context because you know different things now. So that's why I kind of wanted to listen to it again and try to, you know, point out things that are different when you listen to them after the third confession, how they're different now because it's like kind of different meaning because you just know more. So that part, you know, where he asks, oh, you never thought about it before. You didn't know you were going to do it. We know now that he's lying because he says he did plan it for a couple weeks, so he obviously knew he was going to do it. Okay, so here it is. I'm going to play it. That was before that, because like, when I was straddling her, it was kind of like around her waist type deal. Why did you get on her like that? I just, when we got on, when we got on the bed, I, just, I 
Is this where I got on? Is that so she would listen to you? I felt like she could probably listen to me just laying beside her, but I got on top of her. Mm -hmm. And every time I think about it, I'm just like, did I know I was going to do that before I got on top of her? I don't know. Really? That's an interesting thought, Chris. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you knew. It's like, the whole, everything that happened that morning, I just don't, I don't know, like, like, I try to go back in my head, I'm just like, I didn't want to do this, but I did it. Because everything just kind of like... Felt like you had to? It just felt like it was... I don't even want to say it, it felt like I had to. It just felt like there was already something in my mind that was implanted that I was going to do it, and I woke up that morning, it was going to happen, and I had no control of it. You never thought about it before? It was just like, I don't want... Like, when, like, like, you said, like in the sentencing hearing that prosecutor said it takes two to four minutes for something like that to happen. Like, why, why couldn't I just let go? I didn't. Well, that's interesting. Why couldn't I just let was go? Was it feeling like it was in motion and you just couldn't stop it? Yeah, it was just like, I don't even want to know what, what she saw when she looked back at me, honestly. Did you look at her? What was she doing? She was writing. Why do you think she wasn't fighting? Uh, maybe she was praying. Maybe she was just. Now I read, read the Bible and said, you know, like, you know, uh, read the scripture that says, don't uh, uh, forgive these people for they do not know what they do. Mm -hmm. um, maybe she was saying that. I don't know what she was saying in her head. But she, you know, like, like when you guys told me, like, take off your shirt and check, check for defensive wounds. And, like, you know, there wasn't going to be any. She didn't fight. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Why? Like she didn't grab, could she grab your arms or were her arms pinned down or? I don't, not that I remember, I don't think so. I mean, I don't, I don't think like I moved to where my knees were around her arms or anything, but it was just kind of like when I got on top of her and we, we started talking, it was, that was it. It's kind of like in my head, or like in the back of my head, that was going to happen. And just like at the end of the conversation, it was just like, that's what happened. I just wish I could have let go. Did it seem like it was that long, two to four minutes? How long did it seem for you? It almost kind of felt like it was, felt like it was longer almost because it felt like time was standing still. It's kind of like I just saw my life just disappearing before my eyes, but it just like I couldn't let go. It was like somebody else, like, like if you picture somebody else around you, holding your hands, holding you, keep you from not, not letting go. At some point there was a statement about rage. Do you feel like you're in a rage at that point? How do you, uh, how that's do the only you? way I can describe it, honestly. Like a snap or something. I mean, I don't, I don't I guess my attorney had said like some, you know, you know, strangulation is more of like a, I don't know, passionate type thing. I'm just like, I don't know how that could be passionate. It's just intimate because you're right in there, yeah. using your own hands. It's a lot different than someone standing across the room and you shooting them or something like that. So. Okay, so the last clip I want to play for you is the part where they're trying to ask Chris, you know, why he was so mad at Shanann. And... He even says that there would be no reason to be mad at her because they took care of each other and she was basically good to him and he probably would never have thought anything was bad with their relationship if it wasn't for NK. He's basically saying they had a good relationship and she took they took care of each other. I just wanted to point this one out because, you know, a lot of people, you know, say, oh, poor Chris, she treated him so bad and he was so unhappy. But he says it multiple times, actually. He says it in this interview. He even mentions it in the book at one point. They had a good relationship, and if it wasn't for NK, he wouldn't, wouldn't even ever have known that there was anything wrong with the relationship because there wasn't anything wrong. It wasn't that the relationship was bad. It was that he wanted to be with NK. So, I don't know. I just wanted to point that out for all those people 
who think poor Chris, he had it so bad with Shanann. In reality, he, I think he was happy. Like, I think, of course, all marriages have their ups and downs and they have their issues, but generally speaking, well, I guess I should be more clear. I believe he's a narcissist, so I guess I should say I think he was happy as far as how happy a narcissist could really be because we know their limitations, so, and happiness is definitely one of their limitations because in reality, it comes across like they love themselves and think highly of themselves, but in reality, they actually feel the opposite about themselves. So, but I, I guess my point is I'm just trying to um, explain how he probably would have just kept going on with that relationship and he would have been satisfied with it if it wasn't for NK. Like, he didn't even realize that something needed to change if NK would never came into his life. Now, I'm not saying that somebody else couldn't have came into his life in the future and he would have done the same thing, you know? He would have discarded his family just like he did here. Whether he would have done it to that extreme, I don't know. But I'm just saying, of course, it could have happened down the road. But my point is that it wasn't necessarily that he felt that Shanann was so bad to him and, and that that relationship was so bad. At that moment, if NK didn't come into his life, he would have still be with Shanann until maybe somebody else came into his life that offered him something that would give him more supply than what Shanann was giving him. But it wasn't that he went out searching for it because Shanann wasn't giving it to him. It was more that it came into his life and it was giving him more supply than Shanann, so he wanted to discard his family. But I don't believe it has anything to do with Shanann treating him bad. I, I don't believe that at all. I think it all has to do with him and NK and what NK was offering him, the supply he was getting from her. And of course, this is only my, my opinion. I mean, none of us know really for sure. It's, you know, by everything that I know from the case and all the interviews and all the details I know, it's just my best educated opinion on what I believe their relationship was like, and I'm just trying to understand it like everybody else, you know? We're all just trying to put the pieces together and try to better understand it, so, you know, I throw out my opinion and then I look forward to hearing your guys's, and then a lot of the times your guys's opinion will add to mine or even change my opinion sometimes, you know? Sometimes you guys will point out something that I miss. Okay, so here is that clip of him talking about his relationship with Shanann. So then when Tammy was asking, why were you so mad at Shanann? Um, it was part of it, just this whole family strife. That, that, that's the only thing I can think of right now, because I mean, there's no other reason really to be mad at her. Since she, we took care of each other our whole, whole eight years. It was just like a good relationship. I mean, it's just like, if I never met Nikki, would I ever have, you know, thought our relationship was bad? I would not. Interesting. You know, I, I, you know, that's one thing I always thought about, like, even Nikki asked me, like, if, you know, I don't want you, she said, I don't want you to leave your wife if, just because of me. I'm just like, like, what do you mean? She said, well, just, if, you know, if you met me, like, would you have known? I'm like, I never thought I would have strayed away from her at all. Like, I, I've never followed, and I like, tried to follow anybody, you know? But. Okay, guys, that's the end of this video. Hope you guys enjoyed it, and you guys all have a good night. Bye.